start off with one general thing right off the bat. I am going to be going through some aspects of filmmaking. Some of it's going to be a bit of a 101. Some of it's just going to be really basic ground earth stuff, camera settings, that kind of thing. Some of it's going to be a little bit more esoteric and I'm going to be skipping over sections of traditional filmmaking learning. If you want to stop me with a question, if I say something that you feel needs justification, if I move into an area and I say something that sounds like nonsense and you don't know why it has anything to do with what I'm talking about, stop me. Ask. Encourage that conversation because it means that I get to explain if I haven't made it clear already. So, uh, I have taught this before. It's been a while, so attempt to be generous with me. I realize I am not usually, so uh, I won't take it no, personally. No, mercy, mate. No, no, mercy. no mercy is a completely valid option. <laughs> I, I, I will completely give you that. So, when you're doing filmmaking, you're usually talking in three stages, which is pre-production, production, and post-production. I'm not going to follow that structure for the simple reason that it's kind of not what the cinematic look is about. That's what filmmaking is about. The cinematic look is actually easier to break down because the assumption is you guys don't have a budget. You guys don't have lots of fancy camera gear. You have a camera, a location that a friend owns, and some people you know who, know, you know who can act for you. So pre-production kind of isn't part of the conversation in that way. So really, we're going to be talking about three things. The settings, the setup, and the style. Settings, and I am literally talking about camera settings. Uh, there is some stuff there that will help you achieve that cinematic style either because it helps in camera or it's setting you up for the pre-production or the post-production stage. So the things you can do to make your life easier when you get to that part. Set up how you have set up your shot, what you're doing to maximize your space and kind of create that cinematic look in camera, and your style. A little bit about the way you're shooting and what you can do with your footage once you have it. Settings. Who knows what this is? Who's kind of familiar with cameras to a degree? Kind of a little, 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 a little bit of wishy-washy, but that's fine. So generally speaking, when you're looking at photography, there are three main settings. That is your f-stop, your shutter speed, and your ISO. All in all, those do a couple of little things, but I'm going to go through the basics of first your f-stop. F-stop, when you change it on a camera, does has two effects. The lower your f-stop number, the wider your aperture of your camera, it's letting more light in. Lower f-stop equals more light in the image. But it's also changing your focal length, which means what in your, fo what in your film is in focus. If I'm at this point, f32, I mean, good grief, I hope it's a very bright day because it's going to be a dark image, but it means that Pretty much everything you're looking at is in focus. Me, the sky behind me, and everything in between. As we go down the range, you're going to end up with a narrow band of focus. So if you have ever seen a picture where a person is sitting on a bench, everything behind them looks blurry, everything in front of them looks blurry, you're looking at a narrow band of focus. Down here is your ISO. ISO really is just how sensitive is your sensor in your camera. If you can't get this right, this is where you compensate. It's a dark image, you're shooting at night or you're shooting in a dark room, you have gone as wide as you can with your f-stop and you're still in a dark situation, you need to up your ISO. The higher your ISO, the more grainy your image. Resist the temptation to use that as a compensation for film grain. It's not the same. They look completely different and you will ruin an image if your ISO is too high. That's just bread and butter. However, for filming that cinematic look, you only want this part of your f-stop range. You want to keep your f-stop very low because if you actually look at films, stuff is out of focus. That is quite normal. It's how you draw attention to your figure. So if you have a person who is standing in a room, the room behind them is usually out of focus. And if there's something standing in front of them, that's usually out of focus. It means that your eye is drawn to the main figure who is the principal of your shot. So using your focal length and making it narrow gives you more control over what your audience sees. Now, this is kind of what I'm talking about. So here is f-stop 16. You can see that the grass behind her is in sharp and you see that 
You have the girl, also sharp, but it's not a very dynamic image. It looks slightly flat, and there isn't a lot of color range. As we move down the f-stops, yeah, the background is quite blurred out, but suddenly a lot more attention on the principal subject, and it's a sharper, fuller image. You're getting better color range, you're getting better light range. This is what the difference is. So, we're here again. Shutter speed does not count for your filmmaking. Shutter speed is what you use when you're doing photography to pretty much say is there's going to be blur and how quick your shot goes. It's how quickly your aperture closes when taking a shot. FPS, frames per second, which is what you're filming in, follows different rules. And the rule is very simple. Shutter speed equals FPS times 2. So if you're filming at 24 or 25 frames per second, you are setting your shutter speed at 50. Don't argue. It really is the basic backbone of filmmaking because it's what gives you natural movement. It's something called 180 degree rule, which is generally speaking that when you are shooting, your FPS doubles up to give the human eye the impression of movement. The human eye registers 50 frames per second to create smooth motion. If it's lower than that, things start looking jerky. When you're filming at 24 frames per second, what your camera is actually doing is taking a picture, doubling it, and then doing the next one. And it's doing that 24 times, which means you end up with 48 images. Smooth motion in terms of your eye, but if you're going at 24, it's just off enough to give everything a slightly different motion, and it's the motion we associate with cinema. No matter how big the film, you're usually looking at 24 frames per second. Television, a lot of times, films at 25 or 30. And that is when you see documentary footage where everything looks very lifelike. It doesn't look like a film. That's probably because they're right working at a higher frame rate. Seriously, films are only 25 frames a second. 24. What? Yep. So games are going to 60 or more. Way, way up. Seriously? Because you're trying to create smooth motion for, for the gamer. 24 frames per second is what film is shot at, unless you're going for the ultra high frame rate stuff, which is, they, they tried it. I think Gemini Man got released at 120 frames per second. People hated it. They went back to 24. They were going to do the new Avatar movies in 120. They watched Gemini Man. They came back to the drawing board and said, nope, we've changed our minds. It doesn't work. It's not giving the effect we want. So if you film something at 30, 50, 60, change your shutter speed accordingly and look at the difference in the footage, it matters. And it is creating that cinematic movement in film. It smooths everything out just a little bit. It's taking the edge off the reality. So, 24 inch frame per second is your key bread and butter for filming a cinematic shot. If your camera doesn't give you the option at 24, change the setting. Usually, if you're in PAL, it'll only give you 25. Go into your settings and change it to FDSC. That'll give you 24 and it'll give you the higher range of 60. If you want to film slow motion, film in 50 or 60 frames per second, and when you're importing it into whatever editing program you're doing, change the playback to 24 frames per second. That's how you get slow motion shots. If you really are desperate, I actually have some slow motion footage I shot while I was in Oman to kind of make the example, but I can show that at the end. Uh, that's also an example of color grading, but I'll get to that later. So slow motion, higher frame rate, because again, you're slowing it down in terms of what your camera did, filming for cinematic real time, 24 frames per second, just the way it is. Do they use that for, like, friends, for example? 25 for friends, because it's TV. Okay. Seriously, just for one frame gets a difference? Yep. Why? Human eye. We don't register that difference in a visual capacity, but our subconscious has been trained that when we're sitting in a big cinema screen, we're expecting movement to look a certain way. Okay. So if I'm watching a guy running on a big screen, right? Do you expect that to look exactly as it would look if you were sitting at a park bench and watching a man run by? Or does when does about it, but no? But if you think about your, if you look at, remember a film where someone's running, Tom Cruise always running. Yeah. It has a particular look to it. Okay. It has well, a, the Forrest Gump. Forrest Gump. Well, also that. He was running. Different. Yeah. So what you're watching is there's a slight combination of blurring as the shutter speed is working in terms of the motion. And there's a slight question of how the motion looks. 
And that changes not a lot, but a little bit with your frame rate. And those little touches are something that your brain has been taught to recognize as this is cinema, this is television, this is documentary. I can show you a sample of footage from almost anything, and you should usually be able to tell me within a second or two probably what it's been shot for. That's begun changing recently because a lot of television shows have started going for 24 FPS, but those are Game of Thrones. Those kind of things started going for a cinematic look. Yes, low ISO. If you are shooting video, go for the low ISO. If you think grain from a high ISO looks bad in photography, the moving grain from high ISO in shooting video looks awful. You are better off working on the other side of the camera and adding more light to your scene. Keep that ISO as low as you can, really. <laughs> it makes such a difference. Never really push it above 400, I would say, for film. If you are shooting with a camera that can do it, go for raw footage. Uh, that may be, not be a setting you're used to. Try and find it if your camera doesn't do it. Go for 1080p. You can go for 4K, but for example, this camera here, the N50, if you shoot in 4K, it will crop the image to work with the sensor. And what you're actually doing is limiting what size of frame you have at the end product. So if you film something in terms of here, this is 1080p. If I change that setting to 4K without even moving an inch, I'm here. So I have limited my space information. 1080p is pretty much what everyone wants anyway, because it's a lot easier to work with in post. Uh, you can go for 4K, uh, but you're so going to zoom in with 4K. You can zoom in, but it's also a lot more intensive for any program you're using afterwards in terms of post-production. It has to do a lot more work for very little extra. I'm not a huge 4K guy. I don't mind it, but I think unless you're really pushing for a 6K big screen experience, the difference is minimal. That's a personal thing. Some people really like 4K. It gives them a better visual dynamic they feel. For me, that has a lot more to do with how you're filming and how much light you can put in your scene. Okay. Try, if you can, not to add any filters on your camera. That is not talking about ND filters or anything. That's talking about if your camera's sitting, say, ooh, do you want this to look more red? Say no, do that in post. Don't do it on your camera itself because you are limiting what you can do with your footage later. So, that was supposed to say setup, but for some reason that hasn't come across in this PowerPoint. Yay. Smooth, bro. Right? It's uh, great. So, lights, camera, action. Everyone's heard these three words. They are actually your guideline for setting up a shot. You want to set up your lights, you want to set up your camera, and you want to decide on your action. Every time you're setting up a shooting camera in a new position, this is the three things you consider. And just try to remember, every time you change the camera angle, every time you move your camera to a different shot. Excellent, I've set up my camera, lights, camera, action. Move my camera, lights, camera, action. And if you keep that mnemonic, you are going to find setting up shots becomes much smoother and easier because you're moving in the right order. This is the hierarchy of setting up a shot. What can you tell me is similar about all of these four very cinematic shots? in terms of the lighting. Shadows. Shadows are your best friend for a cinematic visual. Because it again, it's doing the same thing as the focus thing. It's drawing your eye to a specific point. And two, it's dynamic. Shadows adds depth and character to everything on frame. So if we go back to this one, facial shots almost always in film Half the face has some degree of shadow, and the other half is light. So we get to see the actor. There's a, key, there's a backlight here, there's a key light, there's a full light so you can get the hairline. And those things are making that actor three-dimensional in your head. You are getting enough visual information to be able to imagine what this person looks like in a three-dimensional space, not just a flat dimension. It also helps a lot for creating layers of space in your frame or creating a dynamic port. So you're not just looking at a flat image, you're looking at a specific point. Camera. Where have you put it? What lens are you using to tell your story? 
This is kind of the same thing I'm going to say about the focus thing. It's the same thing I'm going to say about the shadow thing. Those things are great for making something look pretty. They should be motivated camera decisions. You want to tell your story through what's happening on screen and how you put it on screen. That aspect of the storytelling should shine through. If you are not making active decisions in terms of your lighting and your lens for story purposes, then why are you making them? Pretty does not tell a story. Ooh, everything can be really pretty, but what is it doing for your story? Story doesn't need to be a big narrative. It can just be the atmosphere you want. So you make a decision on what you want someone to feel watching this. That should be motivating all of these decisions. That's how cinematic things look. It's when everything is working together to tell the same thing. So this is the framing aspect of it. So where have you put your camera to put your subject? I have an actor, he is standing on a rooftop. First things first, I have chosen a narrow focal length so that everything behind him, you know what it is, you can see the eye of London, but it's not in focus, he's the focus. And then we're using the rule of thirds. So we are putting his eye right on the third line, we are putting a point right on the third line, we are using a, this, this third line to go through a structure, so it's creating a little bit of that shape, and we are making him the central focus. Rule of thirds is just a nice, simple, clean way to frame things. And it also makes editing really easy because editing is all about catching points. And you can put that on your camera side as well. Yeah, absolutely. This is the easiest one to get on a camera and it's an easy one to just have on there. A lot of times I'd recommend you not keep it on there because it makes you do everything in this. It's hard to see the other framings once you put this one as an overlay on your camera. So if you've decided you're going to go simple and you're going to shoot in thirds, fantastic, leave it on there. If you're going to try and experiment, take it off. Give yourself that option and freedom to see it in a different way. Because there are different ways. So this is cross framing, which means that we've got a central subject, which is right in the middle of my crosshairs, and we are lining everything up on two sides of that point. This is very useful for conversations because what you have is one person is speaking to an empty space. You know there's a person standing here, just by the way this is framed. If I was going to then cut to the other person in a conversation, it would be the same thing but in reverse. A person here and an empty space here. That's a shot reverse shot. And it is the most traditional, normal way you ever see a conversation. Uh, if you want to see a great example of how to use that to your advantage, I would recommend anything directed by the Coen brothers. Uh, oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Uh, no Country for Old Men? Uh, the Blood Simple, lots of different movies, look them up. But they have kind of mastered the shot reverse shot and they've used it very much to their advantage for telling story. Because they will have shot reverse shots happening with people who aren't even in the same room. But you can tell they're having conversations. So if I frame this guy here and he's talking to himself about someone else, he's talking to an empty space, and then I cut to someone who's also thinking about him, and I put them here, you know who that person he was talking to actually was. You were telling visual story information through your composition. Kubrick loves this kind of framing. 2001 A Space Odyssey is filled with it. This is uh, The Shining, and that is centralized framing where you are creating depth using the framing. It is an incredibly useful tool for creating a cinematic image because you are making a deep drawing image. If you have a hallway or something, this is such a nice way to set it up and it's very easy because it's just centralized framing. All you need to do is make sure this all lines up nice and symmetrically. If you can do that, you have created a dynamic shot because suddenly it's not just a hallway, it's a hallway leading somewhere. Let's talk about lenses. Generally speaking, the technology of the lens isn't going to be very useful for you. Those numbers are, what millimeter lens are you using? So, do you kind of know what a lens does to an image? Kind of? Let me make a dramatic example. This is called a dolly zoom. All that's happening is that someone is moving a camera forward and zooming out at the same time. So if we start 70, moving, 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 
24 millimeter. See how it's affecting the background? You are creating a deeper image. The background is pulling away from the central subject. And that is what, I mean, that's, they're not doing anything else. There is no other trickery happening here except changing the millimeters. The wider your shot, the wider your millimeters, so the lower your number, 18, 20, 24, you are creating a very wide shot. Lots of background information is being filled in. Which means that if you have a person sitting in a room and you want to show the entire back wall, you're going to need a wide lens shot. You want to have just them be in the focus, you're going to want a narrow lens shot. The traditional one for amateur filmmaking and indie filmmaking is the 50 millimeter for a very simple reason. The wider your lens, the more background, the harder it is to lock. You're going to have to do a lot more work to try and fill all that space with direct visual information and lighting. So if you narrow it a bit and go for somewhere around the 40 to 50 mark, you are actually making things easier for yourself because you are narrowing how much space is on screen. That makes sense? All right. So, action, movement. That is a Ronin city cam ring. If you have one, I envy you. I've worked with these things, they're kind of amazing. They require the upper strength of a god. I could hold one for maybe a five minute stretch before I started having my arm break on me because you are having to hold it here and it weighs with camera maybe. This is a camera on a slider being pushed through. It's from a film called Layer Cake. It is kind of a masterclass in how to use all the stuff I'm talking about, even though it didn't have a huge budget. Is it Tom Hardy? Tom Hardy is in it. It is Daniel Craig's movie that got him the role as James Bond. It's way better than any James Bond film. It, it just is. It's a good film. It's a great film. Layer cake. Layer cake. If you was like... Was one of Tom Hardy's first films? Eh, it wasn't his first, but it was kind of up there, yeah. Uh, this was directed by a guy called Matthew Vaughn, who worked as a producer for Guy Ritchie before he split off and started making his own movies. This was his directorial debut. This is a, and the movie is a great example of all the things you can do with a film to make it look stylish and snappy that have nothing to do with money. There's no CGI really. There's no huge dynamic displays of anything except skill. This is telling you everything you need to know if you realize that this is from the point of view of a character. There is a man sitting on the other end of this watching her and this is what he sees. So we are using the background to create action. We have people moving in the background to create a dynamic frame, but she is central. Her movement is what matters. They are slightly out of focus. This is what I'm talking about, where this doesn't take money. This just takes active decision makings to use filmmaking for storytelling. So those kind of slow motions kind of make work for you. Chances are you're not going to have a rig for doing that. There are a couple of ways I can cheat. Uh, number one, if you have a tripod like that, what you do is you take one of the legs in, so you have a two point, and then you lean with it. And that creates a relatively smooth motion. If you have a fluid head tripod, even better. Most likely though, you're going to be working handheld. This is indie filmmaking. This is low grade, no budget stuff. If you are doing it with handheld, and this is going to sound stupid, you're going to need to work in a specific way. The samurai stance. I am not joking. You don't have to do it this way, but I guarantee if you try it, it will make a big difference. Now what you do for what I call the samurai stance, everyone has a different name for it, is two things. Number one is when your positioning is. You have the camera here, here, and lock your eye to the viewfinder. That is creating three points of contract contact, which means that your camera is going to move as little as possible. And then it's a question of how you move. You could do this, which you can imagine creates quite a image. Now the samurai stance is not actually made for filmmaking, it's something that's used by boom operators. I learned this from a guy called Matthew Dancy who is a boom operator in London, he's also a sound editor. And what you do is that you move with a wide positioning like in martial art, and you move it like this. And that creates a much steadier, smoother motion for your camera. If you do it like that and then throw a little bit of stabilization on in post, it looks like a steady track. The motion is almost impossible to see. 
and it makes shooting a handheld way more cinematic than it usually has that documentary feel. <sighs> that was supposed to say style. <laughs> Yay. Ah. <sighs> We're, there, not, we're not in the business of making perfect things here. So. I've never been in the business of making perfect anything. <laughs> yeah, so this is a still from Suspiria. If you haven't seen it, probably the best example of how overdramatic color can work in a film's advantage. Uh, this is the original, not the new one. Uh, directed by Dario Argento. Framing. That's a stylistic decision. And that is when you're using something to create another frame inside your frame. Original frame is a square. This is the triangle. If you ever see someone standing in a doorway, Tarantino loves this. That is framing within a frame. And it is something that adds a very cinematic quality because it adds layers of depth automatically. We already have one layer, two layer, and the background is the third layer. Three layers of depth are kind of the minimum grade for if you want to do proper depth film filmmaking. If you really want to have fun, watch anything that um, who has uh, Roger Deakins as a cinematographer. Because then you end up with this kind of thing. Lots and lots and lots of depth. If you have the opportunity to have a deep field behind your motion and action, use it. If you are in a hallway, use the length of wall and create a deep image moving through that hallway. Don't stand flat. Depth always looks cinematic because it gives an impression of size and scale. Even if you don't own any of this stuff, it's still in a frame. And as long as you haven't caught a specific person who didn't agree to be in the film or someone's advertisement, you're not actually breaking any rules. Fair enough? And then, last but not least, and kind of a stupid thing to have to talk about, but it is very important to achieve the cinematic look people want, color grading. So, raw footage, color grading. You don't need to learn a lot. It isn't very complicated. Uh, I have an example that I'm going to show. I have a piece of footage I shot a while back at university. We, and me and a couple of people, were given a challenge. You have four hours come up with an idea for an action scene, film it, edit it, hand it in. Four hours. We did. And what we did looked okay. It wasn't great. I have now, later, I found this piece of footage, and a couple of days ago, I sat down for about an hour, hour and a half. I did a color grade on it, and then I added some little effects to make it a little bit more cinematic. So, let me see. Is this for the difference? Yes, so I'm going to be showing the original first, if I can actually make this darn thing do what I want. Help! Down at the bottom, scroll to the bottom. <laughs> I'm trying. And finder. Finder. Yeah, your folder should be there. There you go. Excellent. So. This is the film school. This is something I made when I was at university, yeah. I don't know, cool. is the sound working? Uh, yes, yeah, great. So, we took a piece of royalty-free music, layered it on top, added, I think, one, maybe two sound effects, and again, shot, edited, all the whole nine, start to finish in about four hours total, maybe. So, certainly nothing too impressive. <laughs> And again, so what I've done with this one, I really I'm haven't... Sorry, I'm sorry, now you have to come to the acting workshop. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Dost thou mock me? Don't be mean. Don't be mean. I told you I can't act. No, 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 I said it was decent. I'm I told you I can't act. I don't pretend to be an actor. No, 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 I said it was good. I was like, you have no excuse not to come to the next acting Oh, workshop. sure I do. But that's okay. And now, same kind of thing. I have done 
three things with this. I have added a color grade, something I just did on the my free version of DaVinci Resolve. It's something that is, is just available. You can just download it and use it. It doesn't require a lot from your PC. It's not difficult. I learned to color grade with a guy who used to work for the BBC, so I have a bit more experience than maybe a standard, but YouTube has plenty of tutorials to take you through the basics. And what I did is the basic job. I white balanced. I balanced in terms of different shots. I kind of graded my colors to make everything nice and smooth. And then I added an L a LUT, which is pretty much just a film look lens that you layer on top of your film. I added in one post zoom. So it pulls in the camera at one specific point, And that's something I did in post. And I added top and bottom bars to give me a wider look, which is again, one of these things that looks cinematic for no good reason. It just does. that turned up very good on that screen, but that's okay. If anyone wants to actual copy or wants to see it on this screen where it looked much better, that's fine. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's this thing where... Yeah, I mean, it's some of these things where you just had a little bit of work, a little bit of balancing on where your color spectrum is. And the simple fact is that there's one of these shots, the one where you have a close-up of my face, where I didn't white balance. Forgot to do that when we were making it, and I tried to correct it a bit here. It's still a little overexposed, but not as much as it was in the original. And that's kind of where the post stuff comes in. It's kind of trying to smooth out those little things you may have forgotten to do during the production. And it's generally just adding a little bit of a layer to what you've done. And with modern DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, you can actually do quite a bit. Those That was filmed on I'm not going to say a standard camera, but just a normal DSLR camera. And most of the shots were either handheld or on a tripod. Nothing too complicated. We used a public space. There was no added light. We didn't have a single light source that wasn't natural in there. And we had no time and we just did it. And just by doing a little tweaking in post, it does make it look more cinematic. And again, I didn't do anything really advanced there balanced, I color graded a little bit to make everything match nicer, and then I added in a LUT. And LUTs are available online for free. Lots of good ones. I used a free one. Hmm? What are you talking about just now? LUTs. No, it's not. Okay, so when you're doing a color grade, you can either go in and do every shot and make everything nice and tweaked, or you can do the easy man, simple man's version. Go in, go through every shot, Make, match everything together so it all looks smooth and nice and like it all matches the same color grade. And then throw on top something called a LUT, which is, for lack of a better term, a filter. It makes it look either more blue, it makes it look, it brings out certain colors. It's a free, get out of jail free card, pretty much. Stunts is the stands for lookup table, right? Yeah. So it takes each pixel and then adjusts. Yeah, so what it does is pretty much a color correction guide. So it says that for every pixel that looks like A, it's going to make it look like B. So if we use... Is that loose focus? Hmm? Nope. Well, let me give you an... Oh, God. I hate Mac. I do. doesn't like you. I know, but that's fine. <laughs> What's, uh, which, which one? V very few people do. So let me see. And please don't go to the start. I beg you. Damn it! The end, maybe. Ah! It's okay. It's okay. Go back. Go back. Huh? Yes. Excellent. So, this could easily be a lot. Honestly. Number one, you know how, see how this is kind of almost grayed out? That's what raw footage looks like before you've done anything with it. That's just a byproduct of shooting in raw. It is getting as much visual information as it can onto the lens and compacting it into a single image. It doesn't look great when you export it straight out. It's when you start doing stuff with it that it suddenly works really well. So let's take, for example, the colors here and the colors here. This is the same thing, 
But when I have told my LUT, my filter on top, it's the same as when you use an Instagram filter. Same, exact same concept. It's just a little bit more advanced and a little bit more, I don't want to say carefully designed, but a little bit more subtle. Where it's telling me to bring up my whites, it's trying to enhance my blues, and it is going to bring a golden shade to anything that has a hint of yellow in it. So, for example, uh, I actually have one that I added a different LUT to, uh, which is some footage I shot in Oman in slow motion, just for fun. And on top of it, so I was working in a desert environment next to an ocean. So I threw on top a LUT, which is designed specifically to bring out two colors, orange and teal. So instead of making everything blue, it adds a slightly teal blue-esque thing to it. And it enhances those colors and it lowers the other colors. And it's that kind of thing where, again, it's like an Instagram filter where it automatically makes a picture look better as long as you don't overdo it. So what you do with the LUT, and this is the thing I'm going to say, is that if you are using DaVinci Resolve, which I would recommend everybody get because it's free, and it's professional-grade software, there is really no catch. If you're adding a LUT to it, change how much you're using. And you can look up a tutorial on how to do it, but generally speaking, you throw on a LUT, and it's at max. You're at 100%. Lower it down to anywhere from 20 to 30. Don't be tempted to overdo it. And as long as you make it subtle, it makes a very big difference without being overwhelming. And it's the same thing I will say for everything I've just said. All of the techniques I've given shouldn't be used all the time, all at once. They are additions and highlights. They are not your whole color palette. Even though we'd all love to hear someone in a song hit a really beautiful high note, I would hate to hear the entire song sung in it. Nobody wants to hear everyone go full falsetto all the time or hit the lowest bass all the time. You need to have those balances so that when you're leading up to it, you go da -da 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 -da, and then hit that high note where the color is really strong and the framing is perfect and the motion is moving in and you've created a dramatic moment. And then you need to follow it up with normal things that make that moment feel more important. It's all about hitting your highlights and that's when those techniques really come in. And that's how you create a cinematic moment and a cinematic look not just by throwing everything at the wall and hoping something sticks. It should be informed by story. Uh, yeah, I'm done, pretty much. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. No problem. So